So there are less than 100 engineers at Airbnb when I joined, and we had a new hire tradition of welcoming these newcomers by having them run underneath what we call a human tunnel. At the end of this tunnel was a large bean bag where they were to jump onto while we all clapped and cheered. After our engineers completed their human tunnel run, we gave them an onboarding test to get them familiar with our monolithic code base. At the time, almost all of our engineers were coding in our monolith daily. As our engineering team grew, so did the length of the human tunnel. At a certain point, it was no longer feasible for us to uphold this tradition. Now, in 2019, we have over 1,400 engineers spread across the world. My name is Jessica, and I'm an ex-monolith engineer. I spent two years working in the monolith as a full-stack engineer, and I moved to our infrastructure side to get experience on our core services team. On core services, we build out the large data services that power the foundational base as we move from monolith to services. I'll be discussing how Airbnb managed to scale its engineering team by redesigning its technical architecture. I'll briefly cover the reasons why we decided to migrate, and then go into service design tenants that help us do this in a disciplined way. I'll then cover the order of which we decomposed out of the monolith in a way to reduce the number of dependencies, and then cover some of the best practices that we learned and developed along the way. During our journey, we found that there are not only technical challenges, but organizational challenges as well. So I'll cover some of the changes that we saw within our culture and conclude with results that we've seen so far from our journey. We are migrating from what we call monorail, which is our Ruby on Rails monolith. A monolith is responsible for both server and client side functionality. So if the monolith could handle everything, why bother migrating away from it? This talk will also inform you of various animals in nature that migrate. Many birds migrate, and the Arctic tern has the longest migration journey and travels over 2.4 million kilometers in its lifetime. That's like going from here to the moon and back three times. Similar to the Arctic tern, migrating your technical architecture is a million kilometer journey. So why did we begin ours? The answer is really to grow our engineering team. We began to see many difficulties as more and more engineers were joining. Often our team was doubling year over year, meaning hundreds of engineers were adding code into Monorail daily. We began to see tight coupling of code, lack of ownership, and more incidents in production. Developing was a lot slower, and engineers were frustrated. In 2016, we had around 500 engineers, and we really need to ask ourselves the question, how can we continue to scale our engineering team? The solution we landed on was service-oriented architecture, which is a network of loosely coupled services. A client will make a request through some API gateway, and the API gateway will then fan out the request to services, which can call other services or data stores. Some of the benefits of SOA is better ownership, which is clearly defined within the scope of the service that has certain APIs. Each service can be built and deployed independently and scaled separately. After I completed my human tunnel run, I was given a new hire task of implementing a feature in our checkout page, where you would go to book a home on Airbnb. If we look at this now from an SOA lens, we can break this down to various services, such as a home service, a reservation service, pricing and availability. And now this is beginning to look like a lot of services. Of course, there's going to be one big service to call all the other services. So realizing that SOA could quickly get out of hand if we didn't approach it in a disciplined way, we sought to create some service design principles. Penguins migrate, and they have a shared understanding amongst the various colonies to meet in the same place and same time at the end of their migration journey. We wanted to empower our engineers to have a shared understanding of how to build services and APIs in a scalable way. 
Our first design principle was that services should address a specific concern. We wanted to avoid decomposing our monolith into another service that was so large that it was a new monolith. Unlike some other companies, we also wanted to avoid going too far the other way into microservices. Instead, our services were larger focused on business functionality. Services should own both the reads and writes with single APIs accessing them. This means that data is not shared amongst various services, as this is better for data consistency and encapsulation. Another design principle we have is scaling for tomorrow. This means our API should anticipate 5x growth and extensibility of use cases. However, we are not designing for the 20x use cases too far into the future. We want to make sure that we're not over-engineering our services, but also making them flexible to withstand our upcoming use cases. Another one of our design principles is building for production. It may be tempting to cut corners for an API that is internal traffic only, or only for prototyping, but it's important to build each service and API to production standards. This means having proper alerting, observability, security, and reliability measures. With some of these design principles in place, we saw to begin the migration. Monarch butterflies migrate, and they have an interesting migration path because their journey is longer than the lifespan of any one butterfly. That means it takes multiple iterations of the butterfly life cycle to complete their migration journey. For us, when we decided to decompose, we realized that there were multiple iterations of our request life cycle that we wanted to abide by for our migration journey. The first version of this request life cycle uses monorail only. Monorail is responsible for the presentation, business logic, and the accessing layer. Version 2 is descoping monorail to being only a routing and view layer. Instead, we'll send API traffic through our network of services, which will be responsible for the presentation, business logic, and data accessing. If we look a little closer into what these services are, we aligned on four specific service types. Having these definitions allowed us to have a strict flow of dependencies and enable developers to understand how to design their APIs. Beginning at the bottom layer, we have a data service, which is the gatekeeper to certain data and see, read, and writes. The layer above it is what we call a derived data service. This may have some shared business logic for various contexts and reads from data services as well as its own sources. A layer above that is what we call a middle tier service which is responsible for shared business logic that may be too complex to live in the data or derived data service. And at the highest level, we have the presentation service, which is responsible for synthesizing information from the below services and returning this to our front end clients. So with these all in place, theoretically, where did we begin first? We decided, in order to prove that we could do SOA as a company, we wanted to start at something really core to the business. At Airbnb, at the time, Airbnb's business was guest booking host homes. So we began with the home's core booking flow. It was important to pick something that was complex enough to cover a variety of use cases and traffic patterns so we would have confidence that we could migrate our whole tech stack into SOA. Beginning at that bottom layer for the home's data service, we looked at how home's data was being accessed in Monorail. We looked and found that at the active record layer, we would make a call to the MySQL database. We could then route it instead to our home's data service. The home's data service would originally then go read back from that shared database. As we began to migrate more of the reads and writes to this home data service, we were able to pull out that homes data and put it into a separate, isolated homes database. After migrating some of the core data, we then looked into the business logic. An example of this is pricing. Pricing might need some information about the home, as well as its own stores, such as offline pricing trend statistics. 
an applied business logic and rules to return some pricing that will be used for the product. Moving on to the presentation, we wanted to begin migrating the core flows, such as the search page, the home description page, and the checkout page. The checkout page has various information on it, including pricing and home description, which it'll read from the various services. Since reads are item potent, we saw that they were less risky, so we began with those first. And after we migrated a significant amount of them, we then started tackling the write path. Looking at how writes were done, we realized there was a lot of shared validation logic that we could encapsulate into a middle tier service. For example, this home's middle tier service would be the gatekeeper for deciding if a write should go to the home's data service. So that was version two, incorporating services with monorail. Version three of the request lifecycle is completely getting rid of monorail. Instead, we introduced an API gateway where a mobile client would make a request for this API gateway responsible for routing and middleware. The API gateway would populate request context by calling out to various middleware services, such as session data or risk signals. Then it would route the request through our SOA network responsible for the presentation, this logic, and data accessing. For our web clients, we handled it a little differently by creating this service specific for web rendering. It would return HTML back to the web client and be responsible for routing the request to the proper API gateway method. Similarly, it populates the request context and sends the request to the SOA network. The request propagates in a very specific manner in order to minimize the dependencies, and it's a way that allows us to ensure that we're getting better performance as well. So given that we're moving from world of monoliths to a world of services, it's ideally something that could happen quickly, but as mentioned in other presentations, it's not something that can be done overnight. A lot of time is spent in the middle, in this migration period, where both the monolith and the services need to be supported as first-class citizen tech stacks. And we learned along the way how to make the migration process a little bit easier. Wildebeest have a migration path that's very dangerous. So they've developed the best practice of keeping their young in the center of the pack to keep them alive and safe during the migration. We've developed various best practices to migrate and build services to keep our services and APIs alive and safe and have our engineers build them in a scalable way. And this is done through standardization of service building and API building. We were able to scale through various ways of handling consistency and generating consistent services through frameworks. With frameworks, we auto-generate a lot of the code for us so that developers can work on the actual business functionality of their service instead of the boilerplate. We have consistency through documentation. We make it really easy for developers to document and keep it up to date by having it update on every deployment. We have consistency with observability as well, and have benefited from templated metrics and graphs. During our migration, we realized there are a lot of common ways that people wanted to compare to ensure that they weren't breaking functionality as they migrated from our monolith into services. So if we wanted to compare the original path against the new path introducing a service, we admit the responses from these two paths as Kafka events. These standard events can then be consumed and compared offline in a framework that then stores the results in ways that are easily queryable for metrics to determine if the new path was on parity with the old path. We realized that it was really important to create consistency amongst services, so we created a team, our service framework team, specifically focused on this. They aligned as for using Thrift as an interface description language, or IDL, to help build our services and APIs. Here's an example of what it might look like from a Thrift file. It's configuration-based, 
as a way to define the request, response, and the API endpoint. Each thrift struct is given some name, and you can specify the fields within this particular request. You can see that the request fields are strongly typed, which gives us the benefit of using strong typing in both the communication and interface protocols. We can annotate the various fields, such as this, personal, this foobar field is personal data, which then we can apply various privacy measures to. A response is similarly defined simply as a thrift struct, which is really easy for any engineer to look at quickly and understand the type of data shape that's being returned. Putting these together, we're able to define our API endpoints. We return the response and the name of the endpoint, and then provide the request struct as input. We can then specify the exception that is thrown and provide additional annotations specific to the endpoint. For example, we have annotations such as, this endpoint accepts replay traffic. Replay traffic is taking a copy of our production traffic and sending it to internal targets, which allows us to have better testing against production-like requests. We also can say that this endpoint accepts rate limiting on a per-client basis. And by just putting these two lines, setting them to true, we get these features automatically generated for us within the framework. We can also specify information such as service level objectives or SLOs. This says the contract is for an error rate of 99%, and this will automatically generate alerts and dashboards that reflect this particular SLO. My favorite feature of the Thrift API is this auto-generated documentation. If you look here at this block comment, it appears in our service API Explorer. All of this is a web UI automatically generated upon each deployment of the service. Information such as the owners for this particular service, the tech design docs, or how to reach the owners is defined simply as thrift annotations within that file. Other helpful information about the request or context about particular fields are defined as block comments right inside the thrift file. So it's a really lightweight way for the developer to provide context and keep it up to date as it's changed upon every service deployment. Recognizing the importance of observability led us to create a lot of our metrics as templated. What this means is that the service framework generates a whole bunch of metrics for us, including information about requests per second, the error rates, who's calling them, and it's all done with templated variables. So this dashboard is automatically generated by just selecting from a drop-down menu the name of the service. Having consistent dashboards has been particularly useful for us because in incidents, it's really easy to go to any other services dashboards, know exactly where and what, what the metrics represent. <coughs> so this seems like a lot of work so far, and it was. Salmon have a migration path that's a lot of work as they move from salt water to fresh water and they often need to swim upstream to complete their journey. For us in the beginning, it too felt like swimming upstream as it was difficult to get other teams bought in. 2016, we had one small infrastructure team focusing on a more grassroots movement to prototype this SOA migration. However, it was really difficult for us to convince other teams to start migrating because it took a long time for a service to be built. At the time, it took a minimum of three weeks just to get the boilerplate set up before you could even start coding the actual business functionality. Maintenance of the service was hard and was just an unpleasant experience compared to just writing everything in monorail. So realizing we had this product culture of wanting to ship features quickly, we needed to make service building really simple as well. With the investment and our service framework team, we were able to create a single script that would get our services set up 
within a matter of hours instead of the magnitude of weeks as before. We also understood that teams didn't want to stop progress with their features just to migrate. Thus, we created different ways to incrementally migrate a service. One could have a service that, say, was supposed to support five API endpoints, but only one was ready. That's OK. We allow that service to get production traffic just for that one endpoint to enable teams to start building services without needing to commit to the full completion initially. We also enable presentation service to incrementally migrate. If they need, say, 10 attributes, but only three of them are ready in other data services, we allow the presentation service to fetch the remaining seven attributes back from Monorail. This enabled teams to build services without blocking the progress of their existing features. As many teams started building services in parallel, it did introduce various organizational challenges. Instead of having a single feature being able to be able to complete in monorail, instead it often required multiple services, which often meant multiple teams. This required more overhead and coordination within these teams, and it's still a problem that we're trying to figure out. So if you have any solutions, please talk to me later. We had to make changes to our on-call as well. Previously, we had a set of volunteer engineers who were very good spirits and volunteered to be sysops for the entire Airbnb site. However, as we migrated into many services, it was no longer practical to have these volunteers have enough context on the various services. So instead, the on-call rotation got migrated to the per team. Each service has one team that owns that service. And each team has a few engineers that are dedicated as service owners. A team could own multiple services, and the on-call rotation would be for all the engineers within a particular team supporting all the services that the team owns. So on to some results. Humpback whales have the longest migration journey out of any mammal. And as you can see, a migration journey into services is very long as well. So have we seen any progress? In 2019, we are still not done, but we're at a point where every single engineering team is on the SOA train. Everyone is building services, and it's recognized as important work and part of our overall company goal. Some initial results that we've seen that are really promising is that we have faster build and deploy times. Previously, it took hours to deploy monorail. I personally like to do mine really early in the morning before the other engineers got into the office to avoid this multi-hour deploy train. But now, it takes only minutes, and the number of people deploying for each service is much smaller. We're seeing fewer reverts as well, which also help the deployment process move along quicker. Bug fixes are handled much faster as it's easier to debug within the smaller scope of a service code. And our developer happiness and productivity scores continue to go up as well. So I think we're doing something right. Due to the way that our monolith is structured, we also saw performance wins as well. We have lower latency due to parallelization of making requests to various dependencies. Monorail uses Ruby, which is more naturally single-threaded, whereas many of our new services are built in Java, which is more naturally multi-threaded. Our search page is over three times faster, and our home subscription page is over 10 times faster due to the parallelization of these requests. Looking back, 2016, we had 500 engineers, and two-thirds of our deploys were in Monorail. Now, in 2019, we have over 1,400 engineers and less than 4% of our deploys are in monorail. We have over 45% of our traffic migrated through our API gateway and have built over 450 services with the IDL framework, and they support over 2.4 thousand endpoints. So this is all to scale our engineering team. And as our hiring goals are pretty ambitious this year, I think SOA has helped us enable to 
grow our team efficiently. However, if we look at that checkout page again and what it looks like now in our current SOA world, we do have a lot of services. But each of these services, fetching various pieces of data, is defined in a very bespoke way with customly named endpoints as well as requests and responses. There are various derived services that also have bespoke integrations. So this one team that owns a checkout presentation service is responsible for integrating with dozens of dependencies, which often means dozens of teams, and they have to do this in one-off ways each time. So is there a way for us to improve upon our service building to make our developer efficiency even better? And this is one of the ideas that we are prototyping. Instead, what if our checkout presentation service could make just one request to a reservation entity? This reservation entity would know relationships with other entities, such as the guest and host users on that reservation, the home information for that reservation, the pricing, and availability. So instead of that checkout presentation service, you need to make a request to each of these services individually, we would just make one request to this reservation entity. Realizing how Airbnb's entities are connected in a very graph-like way, we're looking into using GraphQL to make this querying more expressive. And we wanted to take it a step further in the prototyping by making this even easier to quickly write and add dependencies. To do this, we wanted to be able to have just a simple way to add configurations, and then the rest of the data loading code will be generated for you. So the bottleneck of making a new feature shouldn't be hooking up how to read and write your particular data. That should be done within a single pull request with configurations. So some takeaways from our migration so far is prepare for a long commitment. We're in the beginning of our third year, and we are far from being done. But we have seen a lot of wins so far. Decompose out of the monolith incrementally. It's something that takes a long time, but it's worth being really careful about to ensure that you don't break functionality along the way. Be able to scale through consistency. And this can be achieved with various frameworks and tools. But having a standardized API and framework is really important to be able to build hundreds of services. And finally, SOA is not just a technical challenge. It's an organizational challenge that requires a full buy-in of the company. So really think carefully of what fits well with your development structure and how you may need to shift the culture to support this SOA migration movement. Airbnb is having a positive experience so far. Thank you for listening. Uh, how good was that? I really like the banana service. I have no idea what it does. It sounds <laughs> awesome. A, yeah. It's our demo name. Cool. <laughs> Are there any questions for Jessica? I think we have one in the back. Hello. Um, hi. hi. So uh, you spoke about uh, the service decomposition and uh, the services that we're talking to multiple services, the shared context ones, and also the latency improve that you face, right? Uh, how, how did you deal with issues where the shared context services, uh, they had to talk to two different services, and the sort of API responses between those two uh, services were dependent on each other, like a foreign key relationship. Uh, for example, one service is returning you a list of users, and the other services returning you, uh, say, uh, the money associated with each user, right? So uh, it becomes like sort of an N plus one query. So how did you deal with that kind of latency issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely are seeing issues as that um, as we have more services go into mm -hmm. that way world, which is why we're really hoping the prototype for that entity service will help with these N plus one queries because right now for the checkout presentation page. You might need to get some information about the host or guest. But first, you have to get their user ID. And then you go from the user ID to the user service. And from that, then you go to another service. So it is not quite ready yet to share. Hopefully, in a future presentation, I can have a more refined version. But we are um, seeing problems with that, and which is why we're really investing in the prototype that can make it a lot easier to put a lot of this 
behind the scenes and be able to do batch loading of attributes smarter? Good question. Hello. Uh, as you said, like uh, breaking a monolithic application into microservice means a lot of services which end up creating different teams. Okay, and different teams, when they work together, they uh, deliver a single functionality like the reservation page. But different teams may have uh, different priorities. So how do you manage syncing all the deliveries, deliveries together and achieving a single goal? Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we manage the different dependencies amongst different teams and making sure that they're in sync? Oh, you all asked uh, the tough questions of <laughs> challenges that we're facing now. Uh, we've tried, I can tell you what we tried and didn't quite work. We like, had this open enrollment period where there's about a week or two where all the clients are supposed to go to their downstream dependencies and say, hey, we have this particular feature that we think may require work from your team. And this sounds good in theory, but a lot of times when things are earlier in the design phase and engineering hasn't had the chance to really get into the weeds, some of the dependencies weren't clear in that beginning week of the quarter and they pop up later. So as my team at Core Services that is at the bottom of the stack, we often get these requests in the middle of our cycle. So we budget a significant amount of time for these requests that come in more ad hoc. As we know, it's difficult to predict them in the beginning. And another way that we're trying to make this a little bit better is trying to reorg our structure to look a little bit more like our technical stack. So particular features would all be within the same organization so that the incentives and goals for that team are more aligned as they're within the same org. Cool. Thank you very much, <laughs> Jessica. Yeah, thank you. I can answer more questions later. Yeah. Can we just get another round of applause for Jessica, please?